seen a few more folks, so. But maybe we should go ahead and get started. I imagine more folks will be trickling in. Um, so thank you so much for joining today. My name is Kara Palmer. I'm the philanthropy director at Pyramid Communications. We're about giving voice to good causes. And I'm also co-chair of ComNet Seattle Advisory Group. Um, I think a few of my co-advisory um, group members are going to be joining. I don't quite see them on the call. But we have um, Karen Westing with Philanthropy Northwest, Eric Hauser, who's an independent consultant, Daniel Savala, who's with Building Changes, Marissa Kaiser, who's with um, Casey Family Foundation, Judy Tahat, who does a, a number of different um, social change endeavors, and Ann Martins, who's with the Gates Foundation. And so be, on behalf of ComNet Seattle, I want to welcome everybody. Uh, ComNet Seattle is a local group of the communications network, and we're about um, coordinating opportunities for shared learning and connection with each other, with um, other communicators for social good. And the communications network has been around for nearly 40 years now. It's about building community, or actually now it's 40 years, um, building community, supporting learning, and amplifying communications leadership. Um, it's an incredible network of over um, 1600 people around the world and it's sharing inspiration and ideas so that we can all be more effective um, and smart communicators. So you can visit comnet.org if you're not comnetwork.org if you're not familiar with it. I think Carrie was going to put that in the chat um, as well as learn about the upcoming conference. It's it's moved to a virtual conference and it's free. So you can learn more about that if you visit the website. It's going to have great incredible keynotes. Um, Dr. Jones was a previous keynote, and I imagine he'll be on that um, conference this year, but Nicole Hannah-Jones, who founded um, 1619 series on New York Times, Joe Harjo, who's the U.S. Poet Laureate, Rich Richard Besser, who's CEO of RWJF and former head of the CDC, plus there's going to be great breakouts. It's always inspirational. I find it every year. So to learn more, that's also in the chat too. So right now we have folks on mute. Um, and so to please keep yourself on mute so there's not distracted. And if um, you haven't already, or if you'd like to again, please um, use the chat to shout out hello um, and to share one or two words how you're feeling about um, this opportunity to hear from Dr. Jones today. Well, as folks are doing that, I'm going to go ahead and share my two words. My two words are both honored and delighted that Dr. Jones is with us for a conversation about racial justice and renewal. Through his civil rights advocacy and his ongoing march for justice, he's really influenced generations. Yeah. Okay, there you go. Thank you very Thank much. You. Hi, whoever just joined, if you could put yourself on mute, that would be great. Thank you. Um, Dr. Jones has really influenced generations and changed the course of the nation. As the former counselor, speechwriter, and personal friend of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., Jones played a key role in planning the 1963 March on Washington. He had a guiding hand in developing Dr. King's iconic I Have a Dream speech. He was also the one who smuggled Dr. King's handwritten letters out of jail that were then published as a letter from a, a Birmingham jail, or also known as The Negro is Your Brother. And he was instrumental in securing the bail funds for the release of Dr. Go Dr. King and many other de demonstrators. Dr. Jones has also shared the spirit of Dr. King in his timeless and moral yeah. beliefs in writing the book, What Would Martin Say? And he revealed an insider's account with his second book, Behind the Dream, The Making of the Speech that Transformed the yeah. Nation. Today, Dr. Jones continues to inspire us through his involvement in ConNet, through his ongoing work at the University of San Francisco, and teaching a history course from slavery to Obama. Dr. Jones will be interviewed this morning by my colleague, Alexander Wolbiak. Alexander is a talented videographer, um, photographer, and visual designer with a deep passion for moving creative industries into more inclusive and diverse spaces. 
Outside of work, he likes to apply his communications and creative expertise to support Black-owned and Black-led organizations in Seattle's South End. And more recently, you might have seen him out on the protest for the Black Lives Matter movement. Please join me in welcoming them, them both. So take it away, Alexander. Great. Thanks for the introduction, Kara. Um, again, my name is Alexander Woldiab. My pronouns are see he. You. Oh, now I see you. Cool. Uh, name's Alexander Woldiab. Pronouns are he, him. Uh, my family came to this country from Ethiopia in 89, and I was the first born um, in Seattle, and I've lived here my entire life. Um, and I love this city and the state, and it's, it's a pleasure living here, and I also love my culture. And, um, outside of work, as Karen mentioned, I've been very involved in the Black Lives Matter movement here in uh, Seattle, in particular bringing my expertise in media to communities that don't have access to it. Um, part of the recognition of social justice and food justice is media justice and recognizing we've been sort of excluded from those fields and those areas of expertise and knowledge. Um, and I see it as part of my, my work and duty to, to share that expertise and knowledge with my community. Um, so thank you for joining us, Dr. Jones. And uh, I wanted to ask you if you could just start off by telling us briefly about your experience in the civil rights movement and how you came to know Dr. King and how that relationship grew to what it was. Thank you so much. Um, uh, within the restraints of time, I'll try to be very brief. I met Dr. King when I was 29 years old and he was 31. He had been indicted by this state of Alabama for tax evasion and perjury lying on his uh, income tax return from the state of Alabama, allegedly. And uh, uh, his, uh, his chief defense counsel, uh, Judge Hubert Delaney, had, knew me and uh, make a long story short, he had an exaggerated, he, um, Judge Delaney had an exaggerated opinion as to my abilities. So he insisted that uh, uh, I was living in California at the time. So he, he called me to try to persuade me to come and join, uh, not join, to take responsibility for preparing the legal defense of Dr. King against these tax evasion charges. Dr. King, I mean, doc, uh, yes, Dr. King and uh, three other able lawyers, I mean, uh, two tax attorneys from uh, Chicago and, and then a young man uh, from, uh, from uh, Alabama who subsequently became famous in his own right, Fred Gray. So what did he need me for? But in any event, um, that's what, so I said, no, I, had, I couldn't do it. And much to Judge Delaney's upsetness and my difficulty, because he had been a very important person in my early life and going to law school. But in any event, that was on a Thursday night and then a Friday morning. I got a very early call, California time. It's Judge Delaney again, and he says, I didn't know it from our conversation last night, Thursday, Clarence, but Dr. King is on his way to California right now. He's got a speaking engagement for the weekend, blah, 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 blah. And I told him that the very first thing he should do when he gets off the plane is to come and see you. And so I thought to myself, I said, oh no, that's all I need. So one Friday, so Friday evening, Dr. King arrives at my home in Aladina, California, 2751 Highview Avenue with Reverend Bernard Lee. Uh, goes to the, I mean, I answer the door and there are the two of them standing there. Come in and um, you have to understand in uh, February 1960, Dr. King had been on the cover of Time Life and Look Magazine, he was by our current standards a celebrity. Um, so that's, that's uh, you know, my, my, my wife at the time, she's deceased. She, she thought that a combination of, uh, in current terms, a combination of Michael Jackson and George Clooney and uh, uh, the great, you know, greatest actors of all time. Anyway, that's was my introduction to Dr. King and he tried to persuade me based upon Judge Lane's exaggerated description 
of me that I should come and help him. And I said, no. So in the interest of time, I mean, I, uh, the next, uh, he, he was a guest speaker on a Sunday at a largest Baptist church in, uh, in, uh, in the middle class community in uh, LA at the time. Um, again, the name of the community which escapes me now. Anyway, it was, it was the middle class community, it still is. Uh, Dr. King uh, was speaking of the church at this largest Baptist church in this uh, community community and I had never heard Dr. King speak before. So he speaks, he gets up and he says, the text of my sermon, ladies and gentlemen, today is a role and responsibility of the Negro professional to help our less fortunate brothers and sisters who are struggling in the South. So that's when I said, this is one smart dude in my own mind because he had come to the church of the black bourgeoisie and uh, I don't know what's wrong, I got a mental block, I can't think of it. And, uh, what did I say? What is it? Uh, anyway, so I never heard Dr. King speak. So when he spoke, it was mesmerizing. I mean, I had never heard anybody with two, you know, a human being, Germanly constructed with two legs, a mouth, arm, and all those things. I never heard anybody talk like that. The words are like unbelievable. And then he pauses in the middle of this otherwise powerful sermon. And he says, for example, there's a young man sitting in this church today. My friends and lawyers in New York, they tell me that his brains have been touched by Jesus. So, I don't, you know, I'm just listening. They tell me that this young man, a young lawyer, that when he goes into the law library and looks for anything, he goes all the way back to the time of William the Conqueror, Magna Carta in 1066. And then my friends in New York, for whom I have great respect, Tell me that when this young lawyer writes down what he finds, the words are so compelling, they just jump off the page. So I'm listening, knowing that the description of who he is talking about bears no rational relationship to me, but I'm thinking opportunistically. When this sermon is over, I'm going to find out who this young lawyer is, because if he's that good, I need to know him, blah, 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 blah. And then he said, but I had a chance to meet with this young lawyer in his home in Altadena, California. On, Thursday, on Friday night, and I said, oh, Lord. And then, you know, it's not that what I told Dr. King was, you know, state secrets about my, my, my family. My, my, I'm, a, I'm an only child of, of uh, domestic household servants. So, you know, anyway, I, I didn't appreciate him telling 1,300 strangers what I had told him. And, um, and then he did something very unfair. He said, uh, he quoted, he used a poem from Langston Hughes. The actual poem is a, mother, a letter from mother to son, but he changed the lyrics and made my mother the mother in the poem. Uh, life ain't been no crystal stair. And when he, when, he, when he did that, I started to cry because I could have a visual picture of my mother and her domestic servant apron and so forth. So anyway, so after the service is over, you know, I'm, I'm emotionally shook up. I go over and he's very popular. So he's standing on the pulpit of the church. You're signing autographs. And, um, and as I walk over to get near him, he says, you know, I never, never mentioned your name, Mr. Jones. You know, sometimes the Baptist preachers, I never mentioned your name. And I just went over, put my hand on his right hand, pulled him to me. And I said, Dr. King, when do you want me to go to uh, Montgomery, Alabama? That was the beginning of our relationship. Now, let me put this in context so we can, everybody will understand it. In 12 years and four months, uh, with the exception of Abraham Lincoln and the Emancipation Proclamation, Martin Luther King Jr. may have done more to achieve political, racial, economic equality and access to economic opportunity 
and racial justice than any other single person or event in the previous 401 years of the history of the United States. That's how bad he was. So obviously he had a personal impact on me and he had an impact on the world in which you are living. So purposes of this discussion, you know, in, in classical literature, they talk about <laughs> uh, uh, BC and AD, BC before the birth of Christ, and then AD after the death of Christ, dividing time into those things. Okay. What has happened today is you can really divide the history of the United States now into two epochs. You can divide them before the Black Lives Matter movement and after the Black Lives Matter movement. Before the Black Lives Matter movement and after the Black Lives Matter movement. No movement, including the civil rights movement led by Dr. King and C.T. Vivian and John Lewis and I worked on no movement has so transformed a majority, an overwhelming majority of the people in the United States since Dr. King's civil rights movement, no movement. And that is because, at best, we had a very devoted, dedicated minority group of white people who supported us. And the majority of those persons who looked white were Jewish. We were 12% of the population at the time, maybe 13% now. And Dr. King was brilliant. He knew there's no way in hell that 12% uh, of the population was going to impose this will on 88% of the population. This wasn't going to happen unless you could get 88% of the population to see that it was in self-interest, that this nonsense of racial segregation at that time end. But what has happened now is that precipitated by an event that just got to the soul of the morality of what kind of nation are we? The knee on George Floyd for eight minutes and 46 seconds raised the question, just what kind of country are we in the United States? So we would permit this to happen. What kind of country permits this to happen to someone? And you take that and you look at it connected with all so a series of other events that have happened to principally African-American men, but not only, at the extent of, of uh, excessive police force, generically described as police brutality, this transformed the country. And so I will repeat, the challenge that we face and the challenge that the, the you, the mavens, you, the experts in communications face today, you know, you're supposed to be the best and the brightest in terms of how do you communicate? You know, you are presumably the best and the brightest in communicating things. Well, you will not evidence being the best and the brightest unless you understand the historical and fundamental transformation that has taken place in our country as a result of the Black Lives Matter movement. You have, for example, and I'll, then I'll shut up, the largest participation of white people in the history of any social movement. A larger number of sustained protests 
larger than the protests against the war in Vietnam. And the demographic composition of the Black Lives Matter movement surpassed our civil rights movement and the anti-war movement because it forced people to say around this one issue, this one issue, is this the kind of country I want to live in? Is this who we are? And then people in the UK and France and Italy and in Canada and in Mexico and in Japan and in Korea and in Argentina and in Germany are asking, is this the kind of country the United States is? So that's my, my, my contribution uh, to you is to give you something that few others can give you except those few survivors who's still with us like Andy Young and uh, Bernard Lafayette, Diane Nash, James Lawson. There are not too many of us left. There are not too many of us left. And so when I'm asked to uh, speak, the first thing I ask myself a question is, that, no, I, no, why, why, why do I have to go and do this? Well, I don't have to go and do this. I can say no. And then I think to myself, no, you can't say no. Because you've been blessed with longevity. I'm going to be 90 years old in a few months. So how can you say no when you are a walking repository of authentic first-hand knowledge that is here and you have no, you have, a, you have an ethical obligation to share what you know. So that's the reason when Sean Gibbons knows this. People at the ComNet know this. They got my number. They know that if I call Clarence Jones, he can't say no to us. So it's true. You know, they try to, occasionally they'll try to put little perks and say, well, if you come, you know, so forth, you can come down to the conference. But they do. Hey, they got, they, they, they have a spike into my soul. So they're like Dracula. You know, they've, they've got my blood. I know Kara, you know, <laughs> and Alexander, <laughs> and other people from come. May not, may, may not like such uh, images that I portrayed you. <laughs> you are not, uh, you are not Dracula. <laughs> but I'm just showing the depth of my commitment to, to you. And, uh, and I, I commend you. I commend you for taking the time to want to talk to someone like me and use, use me in the classic sense of looking at some of the current issues that you have. So. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm humbled and helpful. Thank uh, you so much, Dr. Jones. I, like, for me, this conversation is beyond invaluable. Uh, you know, I, as a young black man in this country right now, a part of this movement, I understand like the importance of history and um, placing ourselves in a context and thinking about the future and not wanting to re repeat history. And I, I think we as young folks, we have a lot of energy and a lot of potential to continue this work and to see uh, change through. But I also think it's important to have that connection to the, our past. And I think one of the questions I keep coming up against is, or thinking about is, what are lessons learned from your experience that like I myself can take and translate into the work I'm doing now? Like for example, what I just learned from your your journey is don't pass up opportunities to work with leaders, you know? Well, I, I, let, me just, I, <laughs> let me just say, I, I'm gonna have to, I'm just gonna have to say it. The lesson I learned is something which I did not initially believe. And that is the extraordinary power of nonviolent social resistance. When I joined Dr. King, I, I, I mean, he was committed to nonviolence. I wasn't. You know, I'm, I'm his lawyer, so I told him, you know, I respect what he does, but you know, I'd been in the United States military, the Korean War, 
trained in the Special Forces Unit. I, you know, I played football. I, you know, I told him, white dude hits me, he's going down, you know. He says, no, 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 you can't do that. And I said, well, I do not. Nonviolence is for you, but I cannot practice it personally. So he says, well, that's the reason we're not going to let you in any demonstration. You have to advise me. So anyway, the point is, I then came to understand and what I want to share with you. There is no more effective, effective form of social protest that I have seen in my lifetime than disciplined, non-violent social protest. There's nothing more. And the reason, by the way, those people whom we protest against, those practices, they want us to be violent. They, they, want, to, they want to encourage social movements uh, trying to change things to be violent. It's in their best interest that we engage in violence because our violence will obscure and prevent the substance of the message we're trying to communicate. They, they, nothing they want more than for us to be violent. Thing that they fear most is massive nonviolence. And the thing that they, and to see massive nonviolence with a majority of white folks in this country, that's got to scare the bejesus off of everybody. So you have, you are tasked with a, a very sacred duty. You, 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 you're a communication specialist. Your art is how do you take your message based upon the, the foundations of whatever you represent and communicate it in a way that will help the foundations or organizations that you represent to better understand what they should or should not do with their money. But more importantly, the task of communicating has now become much more formidable because of, uh, the, because of the social network. And, and, and I'm pleased to see uh, a group of persons younger than me who for whatever reason, you have decided that you wanted to devote your time and skill sets in this, in this art form of communication. I'll put an adjective to it, of, of social communication. Well, what's, what are you communicating? You're trying to communicate a message from the various organizations you're working with, a message you, that you hope will enable the foundations that you represent, the organization you represent, to better connect with, to better understand the constituency which you seek to serve. Nobody wants to just throw money after nonsense, you know, as, as rich as we may be. There, there still is a desire to be sure that uh, if I'm going to make a grant or if I'm going to support something, I want to see that uh, it at least uh, has the realistic potential of making a difference. So I, I commend you all for that. And you cannot get disheartened. In fact, the challenge, uh, the bar has been really raised uh, for all of you now. Uh, what you were doing last year is qualitatively different than what you're going to be doing this year. The whole landscape has changed. Listen to me. The whole landscape has changed. Because now, front and center to the landscape is that no matter what other things we're seeking to do in this society, nothing will be effectively done unless we deal with the most pressing instances of injustice. Nothing will be enduring. Can't happen. I don't care, you can be Ian Musk and put your rockets up into space 
and you can have all those things. You can do all the, all these innovative things. They're not going to last. They're not going to mean anything. The reason they're not going to mean anything, because we're living in a society, 340 or 400 million people about, we're living in a society. And a substantial part of that society, to use the language of your generation, they woke up. A substantial part of your society in an age group that is saying, no, 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 not in our time. No, no, no. You know, some may be a little extreme, but the center is not. What binds you together? What binds you together is that we don't want to continue life as usual in the United States anymore. We don't want to do it. We, there, there was, there was, you know, we had, we had uh, Eric Garner, we had Michael Brown, all those things, we had those things. But I said, but, you, but you, George Floyd was like, that's it. That's enough, that's enough. That's enough. Now it's, come, now, it's, now it's time to say, no, no, no. Not in our name. Not in our name. Because we as a country and the people are better than this. And those of you who were in the communications business, if you think you were challenged before, well, you just got challenged now. If you, were, if you thought you knew what you were doing in your job before, well, I'm going to tell you something. A lot of the skill sets of what you were thinking before, you better think about how you're going to amend them. Because your challenge is different. And the other side of that is a little biblical phrase I'll tell you, and if not you, who? If not you, who? And if not now, when? Hmm? You're the best and the brightest in this country. And if not you, who? So the Cara Palmers, Alexander, all the very people I see, names, I duplicate. Just, just multiply yourself by 10 times, okay? That's your challenge. I'm not, I don't need to, I'm not here to uh, stroke you, try to make you feel good. I'm here to give you a, uh, an objective assessment based on my experience. You shouldn't, you, you, your task should be, how can I exist on the least sleep possible? Because there are not enough waking hours for you to do what you need to do. And you don't need, you don't need to tell, you don't even engage in this, this nonsense, of, uh, you know, I don't know. I don't know, uh, I don't know, games they call them, mind games. This is serious now. You have the legacy of changing the country. It's in your hands. It's in your hands. And you have now, you weren't aware of how much power you had. It took, it took the Black Lives Matter. You were not aware of just how much power you had. But now you know you've seen it. You didn't know you had all this power. But now you've seen it, so what are you going to do with it? What are you going to do with it to, to carry forward the, the, the legacy of, of Dr. King and of C.T. Vivian and of John Lewis and of so many others? You were challenged. And it's your misfortune to know me. Because as long as I'm alive, I'm going to keep challenging you. You know, I'm going to haunt you. But I'm going to track you down. Challenge accepted. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think you're exactly right. For me, at least, this black, the most recent uprisings have been an awakening to the power. I think I, personally, I've had. And I have, as a communications professional, 
Um, and I think a lot about accountability, accountability that I have to my community, but then also uh, accountability that I demand and ask from white allies. I don't hear you. What's happened? Oh, okay. Continue. I didn't. Did you hear me before? I heard no? accountability I have of, did I hear you say of white allies? White allies. Yeah. Like, okay, you know, good. I work at a predominantly white institution. I understand. And as a, the only black person in that institution, I have to do a lot of that work. And I wonder how in your career, in your lifetime, you've navigated um, holding your white allies accountable to the work that needs to be done and continuing the momentum that you just spoke to about um, in this Black Lives Matter movement at the moment. Well, you know, I bring a little bit of my uh, military uh, training and experience. Uh, where if you're a squad leader of a company, you don't <laughs> you don't ask somebody to do something that you're not willing to do yourself, and that uh, it's the nature of the demographic. Uh, uh, those of us who are African American or or, or our heritage originates uh, uh, outside of. Africa, those of us, um, we, we have, uh, I'm just taking the way I look at it, there never was a time that I have noticed in our country. Now I could be wrong because I'm looking at it from 30,000 feet. I've never seen from 30,000 feet the apparent willingness of an overwhelming majority of white people to listen, to hear, and to support our movement. Never happened before. Never happened before. So those of us who are African-American or those of us who come from Africa and adopted America as our home here, we have been blessed with something we never had before. So you've been blessed with something I never had before. In my time coming up, I didn't, have, you know, listen, listen to me carefully. There was a powerful, dedicated number of white people who supported us without question. But statistically, they were a minority of the country. Listen to me. This is the first time that when I wake up in the morning, I look at myself in the mirror and I say, hallelujah, I'm so glad I'm an African-American because I, for the first time in my life, I have a majority of white people who want to work with me. A majority of white people who are willing for, to forgive some of my nonsense and to think that what I'm doing is really in their best interest. And I better, not, I better go and respond to them right now before they change their mind. You know what I'm saying? So Alexander, you being part of the, uh, uh, the network, all of those people who are white who are part of the network, you better not let them go. Okay, you, you, were, you were blessed, brother. I never had that. And what is blessed is that I have enough experience to know. I mean, I don't even, I don't, I don't have to talk to each of you. I, I mean, I've traveled around the country. Yeah, I'm prepared to say I wasn't prepared to say that years ago, but I am now prepared to say. I may not know them. I mean, I know a few of them, but there are a large number of white people I do not know. But I am convinced they share the same sense of morality, the same sense of social justice that I do. I just don't know them. I'm convinced of that. 
I mean, I'm blessed, sure. I'm blessed to know a Sean Gibbons, right? I mean, please. He's like, I've adopted him, made him part of my family, you know? I'm, I'm blessed to know some of the people at the, at the, uh, the communication network. I mean, this is, this is an extraordinary time. You, you will rarely have, you will rarely have in my, my observation, and I don't know how long it'll last, it's always a point of what I call the counter-revolution, the people who want to take away what we've achieved, who want to destroy what we've done. But so far, this is, this is an opportunity, this is a, this is a time of maximum opportunity. The opportunities for those of you who are part of ComNet and who, and who consider yourself, quote, specialists in the communications business of social ideas. There's never a greater time than now. All of you should be jumping up and down. You shouldn't even go to bed. You should say, I can do without sleep because I don't know how long this is going to last. I want to take advantage of it. All of you. You're never going to, I'm, I'm listen, listen to me now. I'm not trying to be over dramatic. I'm telling you, let me tell you. <laughs> Those 90 years I've, I've walked and been around, they have not been easy. But I am telling you, I am blessed to live to see what I see. Thank you. I really appreciate that response. Um, I think we're going to open up questions to all the participants. And we have our first from Sully Moreno. Sully asks, I feel certain that advancing racial justice is something I will have to work on for my whole life. How do we explain to partners and stakeholders that this work isn't just one in, a one and done project while keeping them motivated to do work that may take a long time to appreciate the true impact? Thank you, Sully. Well, I, I understand there is a, there is a uh, certain uh, challenge and, um, and um, um, an appetite, a silent and to, to uh, want quick and easy results. Um, you know, as Frederick Douglass says, there is no, where there is no progress, there is no struggle. Where there is no struggle, there is no progress. So uh, it is beyond my capability to advise to you or to tell you how you should best apply your skill set. I can give you a kind, I can give you a state of mind, a, as Hegel would say, a Weltanschauung, a way of looking at the world. And, and, and this is, say, you know, there's no better, let, let me put it this way. In the history of the journey that I have taken, worked closely with Martin Luther King and thereafter, there's never been a period in the journey that I've taken, as I look back, that is more amenable and potentially responsible to change than I see today. Has never, listen to me, has never, ever bit of time and I'm 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 a, I listen and I read and I remember so you know it's a, it's the, the old people used to say strike while the iron is hot hot that's what I'm telling you you have optimal conditions and by the way the people who oppose you know that and so they want to do what they can to undermine you and one of the first things they will do is try to invite you or try to invite you, no, try to um, provoke you into violence. They know that the most powerful weapon you have is nonviolence that's supported by millions of people. They know that if they can tempt you to be violent, you'll undermine a broad base of support that you have. So your skill set is how to, how to multiply yourself in a creative way. 
I mean, you're supposed to, I mean, I mean well, hold on now, let me just tell you something. Oh, you're, you're supposed to communication network. I'm not talking to just anybody, you know? I mean, one thing if I was having this conversation with just a group of people, but you are part of the communications network. I'm gonna lay a heavy one on you. If you can't do it, then I don't know who can. You know what I'm saying? If you, with your skill sets, that you were professionally trained and honed in to do. If you can't do it, then who can? You will never ever in your lifetime have an opportunity to apply your skill sets to what you're doing to achieve the results that you want to achieve better than you have now. You'll never have a better chance. That's great. Uh, that's so true. It's like the communication work is twofold. We got to communicate internally and externally. That's right. Yeah. Um, we have another question from Cindy Olnick. She says, you sound much more ha hopeful than you did in June when you last spoke with us. I'm so glad. If we, communic if we communicators can make one specific change happen, what should it be? Um, the change should be, I don't have the specifics, but I don't want to make the police our enemy. I want the police to be part of our neighborhoods and our friend, our, our, our part of our community. So the one thing I would want to avoid, I don't want to go down the road where it appears that we're trying to institutionalize the police as our enemy. They are not. Demographically, African Americans need the police in their community greater in some instances than most communities. So when I hear defund the police, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm saying if defund the police means reallocating resources so that they can be more effective, I'm for it. But if it means shutting down the police department, I'm going, no, I'm not for that. African Americans community need the police greater in some other communities. And, 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 and so the one thing, one thing I can say, say to you is do not be provoked to violence. Stand your ground on the righteousness of your cause. Do not be provoked to violence under any circumstances. You have, think of it. I mean, I say you won the game, but think of it. I mean, my God. In months, not years, in months. Let's take, let's just take a brief period, six months. The country has transformed itself so that an overwhelming majority are saying, Yes, no person, Judge George Floyd or otherwise, should be treated like that by the police. It is simply immoral. It is simply immoral, inconsistent with the kind of country we are. There's a level of goodness that's risen to the top in our country that is that uh, the only people, the people who oppose what you're trying to do are trying to money it up. They want you to, as I said, you know this, I'm, I'm not telling it obvious. They all want to, uh, they all want to provoke you to do, engage in nonsense. One of the, one of the ways, of course, is that, uh, the, the, well, I don't have to go, you, you're smart. 
This is Miss Olnick. Who is that? Olnick asked me a question. That's correct. Yeah, Cindy. Hi. Yes. Do you have family in New York or have family? Yeah, I do actually. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is there anybody in your family that was named Betty? Mm, no. No. Okay. Not that I know of, but I can look. No, no, no. Okay. Betty Hollick was a great lawyer. Really? Yeah, in New York. So. I'll look into that. Thank you. An unusual name. That's why I say Hollick. So. I don't mean to pick on you, so my apologies. Oh, by all means, you won't be the first or the last. Okay. Any further questions? Well, let me ask the question. On the uh, assumption that you are the communication mavens, experts, that presumably have developed skill sets in communicating that are better or different than most. What do some of you see as your principal challenge today? What do you see? I mean, I, 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 I'm saying to you, you may not agree with me, but I'm saying to you that you have, you're with an environment that just transcends geometrically what we had. Okay. You're in a, you're in a stage of history in the United States in which you have a basis of support that we never had. So I guess I'm challenging you. How are you going to, how are you going to respond to this? I can As they open say, it you up can't and, uh, get over. We used to use the expression of our movie, you know, you just can't get over by trying to talk yourself out of it. You can't get over by thinking you're cute. I mean, I can't get over because I am cute. <laughs> oh, look who came, look who, look who came on. Oh, I've been here. Oh, man, come on, this is my. I've been here. Can I ask a question related to- My God's been on, yeah, go ahead. So, I would assume maybe they used different words at the time. Yeah. But when you were working with Dr. King yes. and Congressman Lewis and C.T. Vivian and, right. and so many others, right. you must have been combating misinformation and disinformation. Oh. I know, for instance, you and I have talked about the, the dream speech and a big challenge was making sure that for a lot of folks, you were very, very mindful. For a lot of white America, it would be the first time they would get the chance to take the measure of Dr. King in real time because it was going to be That's televised. Correct. That's correct. And that, mean, and, and that there was a belief that the way he had been characterized in the popular press in the United States had been that he was an instigator, that he was somehow uh, unsettling American democracy. Right, right. He was, but in a constructive right, way. Right. Um, but how did you combat misinformation and disinformation, or maybe the way that, that the work that you were doing was being characterized, or how people perhaps were looking to characterize your work that wasn't in your own words? So I think that's a challenge many of us are facing right now is a crowded information space with lots of people, to your point, trying to muddy the waters. Well, once, that's a very astute uh, observation and question is that when we became, when we became more, when we became aware of it, we then had to um, uh, custom tailor um, the things we planned and plan and considered undertaking, but particularly how we spoke about it to third parties in the press, we we had to be very careful because we knew that there would be a the first effort would be to effort of disinformation of, uh, of mischaracterizing. So I, I can't think of. I only think of my role with, with Dr. King. I, I mean, I remember having conversations with him and I say, Martin, you can't say this or that because 
unless you make it clear, it's going to be construed to be X, Y, or Z. So you can't say this. If you, if you say this, you're giving, if you say this without saying more, you're giving our enemies a chance to use those words against you. So that's, that's the only way I could deal with it. But there was a, there was a constant effort to uh, uh, defame Dr. King. There was a constant effort. I mean, um, he did things at times that uh, contributed to this effort. Uh, he gave uh, his opposition ammunition to use against him at times by his own lack of self-discipline in his personal conduct, in some instances, limited instances. But we, we were aware of that. We, we, uh, we, 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 we knew that there was like a 24-7 a campaign. First of all, you had, to, you had the largest uh, uh, investigative agency in the United States, the FBI, seeking to destroy you and undermine you 24 hours a day. So we knew that. Uh, you know, it's, imagine if you're working in ComNet and uh, and uh, a number of the people you're working with, they're paid informants for the FBI. Imagine you're sitting and holding a conference here and two of the people here on the network. In addition to what you're doing, they're also reporting everything we do back to the FBI because, and they're getting paid a monthly stipend to do that and they're sitting in your meetings. So when they're sitting in a meeting with Karen, Kara Palmer, so forth, she may have a group of 15 meeting people. She may not know that one of them is a stone cold paid FBI informant, waiting to report back on everything she has said or done. Well, that's, that, that was our life. So. How much you, attention did you spend on that? Or, or, I mean, well, I, I the, mean, like the, the, the amount of the attention, um, Sean, was in direct proportion to the extent that we were aware of it. When we didn't know about it, we didn't know about it. But once we, and and, and I was always at a disadvantage because, uh, you know, uh, d d Dr. King sometimes he would be he would call me a left wing McCarthyite. He, went, I was, he said, well, "What do you mean?" He says, "You see." He says, you know, sometimes, Clarence, you, you make me angry. You know, you, you see an FBI agent everywhere he turns. FBI's, Dr. King would say, you know, the FBI's got better things to do than to be spying on us. I said, oh, really? <laughs> There's nothing better they have to do than to spy on us, Martin. So we, I tried to, you know, I tried to, I dealt with it by humor and by dealing with reality. Can I, can I add something to that, too? Yeah, I think one thing that's important to acknowledge also is diversity in our communications industry. So intentional disinformation, I think, is just as dangerous as misinformation, accidental yeah. misinformation. Yes. So in order to prevent that accidental misinformation, you have to have diversity in your ranks, in your company. That is um, correct. And to your point, Dr. Jones, like, what are we going to do? I, you know, I'm working potentially on a series right now for Netflix. And what I've uh, understood is that you can't get a show greenlit in this country if you don't work with a production company, um, a white production company, yeah. right? So, yeah, that seems, that seems to be the reality. So every, at every point for minorities in this country, we're reaching blockages in our own storytelling. Right. So in order to change that, we have to make sure that we have that diversity. So if you're a communications network, if you're a creative agency, whatever it is, you have to make sure that you have that diversity to first combat the misinformation internally yeah. as you um, disseminate that information. And, I, and I, I, I'm, I'm a realist, you know. Uh, if, if I were in your shoes and I was trying to... I, <laughs> I would want to by maintaining what might be called an, an African American, a black production company. But I would align myself where appropriate with white folks. You know, you can have, I don't want you to get, I don't want people to get in this association that uh, black people have something, white people can't be a part of it. No, 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 no. You know, no, no, that, that's, that's not what we're talking about. 
Uh, don't, totally not. It's the unity and sort of yeah, that collaboration right. is going to, it's to your right. point about this movement and its particularities and why it's different from right. what it was during the civil rights. You're dealing, you, you, what are you making, a series with Netflix? It's one that we're trying to shoot in the South End. And, um, you know, we've come up with a lot of roadblocks because what we're trying to fight for, um, for this series is equity in the production company or in the production crew. So we're saying, you know, if you want to tell a story about our community, then you have to come in and train You're dealing us. with Netflix? You're dealing with somebody from Netflix? Uh, it's a production company in New York and a studio out of LA. So there, are you familiar with these equity riders? Have you heard of them? Totally, yeah. Yeah, so USC might be a good resource for you. Uh, University of Southern California was actually the place where they started developing that idea initially. Um, if you want to reach out to me offline, there's a couple of folks I know who might be able to be helpful to you. Um, uh, I know that that effort took flight over the last two or three years. Um, it's run into its own roadblocks, but but it, that's a power dynamic, right? Yeah. And and if you want to make something and you want to make sure equity shows up in every piece of the production, it takes the folks at the top, not just in the production offices, but the creatives or whoever it is who has the name behind it, uh, putting those equity riders and they're becoming increasingly common. Um, I'm kind of disappointed it hasn't been part of the conversation lately. I understand there's other things going on, but it's a very, very powerful tool for folks working in the creative community. Um, in much the same way at the network, we have basically, I don't know if they're, we make a big deal about this publicly, but we just don't host conversations that feature, you know, particularly like ComNet, it's just white men. That's not- All right, Alexander, if you send me your email, Email with your telephone number. Uh, uh, I'm going to, as a one-time thing, you know, don't, I don't want you to get in the habit of doing it. Okay. But I'll call up Netflix. I know who to call. Okay. And I didn't mean to derail the conversation. I, I was just no, 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 mostly no, using no, it no, as no, an no, anecdote. Call, no, I know, I know Netflix. I'll call. Okay. You know, I appreciate that. I know how to put my, I know. Yeah, they don't want to hear. I mean, they, they, I mean, they, they respect me, but they know when I call, they got to do something. I appreciate that, Doctor Jones. Okay, I'll do that. Uh, another, another answer to your question, Doctor Jones. Like, what's what? What do we have the power to do within our field? And I'll just offer this up. I'd be curious if one of my colleagues would kind of pick this up and carry it forward. Is we spend a lot of time at Network HQ and with a lot of our colleagues here and, and elsewhere around the country thinking about how do you operationalize the values or the concepts or the principles of inclusivity, of diversity, of equity. So not just going and doing a training, not paying lip service to it once or twice a year, however that may show up, but really thinking about within the social sector, because we're the do-gooders, because we're in the problem-solving business, sometimes one of our our strengths, but also one of our weaknesses is we tend to define people through their problems. And it means it's our friend Travian Shorters has done a ton of work on this, that it's hard to lift people up when you're putting them down. And a lot of foundations and nonprofits lead with what's missing rather than the aspirations and the shared values that we all have. So I think- You just, you just answered your own question. Well, I was gonna say, I think we have a narrative project in front of us. It's, our country's going through it right now, but I think our field in particular has a real challenge to sort of think about I don't know how, how many of you spend a lot of time thinking about like deep narratives, right? Like how your brain yeah, works. Yeah, yeah, right. Most stuff is conventional wisdom. I well, think a lot of if you are, if you as a communication experts don't think about it, who will? That's right. If it's not you. Who? And if not now, when? That's what I'm trying to tell you. And that's the reason. In fact, this is so important. Is that? Uh, but for the COVID, if we were coming to, if we were coming together in real time like we used to come together, this is so important. I would want to see that as part of an agenda. For you know what I'm saying, mm -hmm. as part of a program. That very issue we're talking about, and so uh, it's so important. Uh, 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 you have to use your creative uh, skill sets, Sean, and try to see that that is a uh, how can I put it? That is a subject that is at least considered. Doesn't have to dominate any part of our, you know what I'm saying? I, I do. I mean, to the point where as we gather for V, which I hope you all will, will join us for, we have in last year in Austin, we had a diversity, equity, and inclusion track. So if right, folks right, right. wanted to be thinking about this. Yeah, year, yeah, right, 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 right. This year, and may, I hope we're not getting this wrong, so tell me if we are, but 
we are not going to have a diversity and inclusion and diversity equity and inclusion track instead we're going to insist every session weave that into the learning into the presentations because we think it's not separate it's not something over here that you go visit occasionally okay, like okay, okay. Got it's got to be part of everything that we're doing well if you, if um, you do that then you're on the right track i would challenge i would challenge everybody on this call to go and look at your website after we get off here and ask yourself because I, I think a lot of us do this. What are the images that you're using to illustrate the problems you seek to solve? Come on, How do you now. describe those problems. That's right. Because I have a feeling a lot of us are not inviting people to solve the problems with us. We aren't framing the work that we do through questions. The how might we or the what if questions that are so uplifting and inspirational and right. inviting, right? That bring people along. I think a lot of the ways we do it is we seek to fill in the blank, negative word, negative word, negative word for something else, negative word, in order to right. pause it. Right. That's a problem. And, and we are, as society's do-gooders, deeply guilty of that. I'll put one other piece on it because y'all didn't tune in to listen to me, but uh, if well, hold it's- Hold on, hold on, sit down. Uh, uh, yeah. You know, you know what you're, you know, you're talking about. What you're talking about is part of the uh, agenda, the part of the uh, when we come together. That you're, you're just you're just talking about part of an essential part of the program that should be on the program. Yeah, that's what I'm telling you. No, I, I agree. We we are so for what it's worth. I don't think I'm giving up the goose here. We're not quite done. Okay. But we spent the last 18 months working on something we called the DEI project. I don't know. We'll ultimately end up calling it when we put it out publicly. Okay. But it's going to have a couple pieces to it. One is we worked with a woman from North Carolina a and t It's one of the historic HBCUs, mm -hmm. or one of the HBCUs. And we did an environmental scan to look at how people talk about their work and how people think about operationalizing DEI. Won't surprise you all to know the big finding coming back was most of us aren't thinking about it. Right. And that's, again, a structural problem, right? That white right, people... Right, 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 right. Or we sit inside these deep narratives. And we don't see the matrix such as it is right. for our... Um, or we haven't until recently, many of us haven't until recently. Um, we're going to create some tools that are going to be sort of bucketed out around the different pieces of work that folks who are going to sit in a communication shop might do right. and allow you to do assessments. How are we doing? Because we know every organization is sitting in a slightly different spot. Some are further along, some are further back. But allowing people to see where they are and then see where they might supplement or build a little bit of strength, kind of like when you go to see a trainer, right? Your arms are great, you need to work on your leg. Your legs are strong, you need to work on your back, whatever it is. That's kind of the theory. Uh, we're going to have that out in the world probably in the next couple of months. If y'all will just bear with us. It's been a big right. piece of our purpose kind of quietly for the last 18 months or so. Um, but why is this all super important? And I'll just give you a little data point then I can shut up. Uh, independent sector has been doing a lot of work on uh, understanding civic life and the role the foundations and nonprofits play. And one of the baselines I needed to know was how do people think about foundations and nonprofits in America? Right, right. <laughs> what they discovered recently was that, and they, this is a very, very credible survey, there's about 2,000 people across the country, checks all the boxes for being legit, was that about 78% of Americans, so that's a lot of folks in Seattle, but folks in Idaho and elsewhere, thought that nonprofits were constructive forces for good and an essential part of a healthy civic, civil society. They were the do-gooders in society. They were constructive. 78%. That, that's a super majority, right? I don't need to tell you all this. Right, right, right. Government sits at about 20% and so does business. 78% is crazy. Yeah. Probably couldn't get 78% of us to agree on what kind of pizza to order, right? 64% right. of those same folks put that same level of trust in foundations. The lower the level, because the philanthropy is a little bit of a black box. But suffice to say, there's a, there's a couple words for what that represents. And it's either social capital or political capital or both. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't do you much good sitting in your pocket. You're meant to spend it. And so I think hopefully a lot of y'all are kind of on the same journey that we are, which is thinking, how do you spend it in a way that's most effective, that's most efficient, can do the most transformational good? Not the marginal stuff. we got to do that too, but the big stuff. Um, I think that's, that's in front of us. And maybe just one last thought, which is a little bit unrelated, but maybe we well, didn't have a big turnout. We did a webinar yesterday with uh, Fair Count, which may or may not be on people's radars. But uh, I've been talking too much. Kareem? Can you, uh, you were with us. You want to share kind of a two or three highlights of what we learned from Janine and Rebecca yesterday? What's fair count? 
Fair Count is an organization that was founded by our friend Stacey Abrams, who was with us in Austin last year. Oh, yeah, 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 okay. That is focused on getting a good count for the census. And maybe oh, yeah, I'll no, no, you don't have to say anymore, I got it. I'll tee up Kareem here by saying they estimate, the folks at Fair Count, we know because of the pandemic and because mm -hmm. life is complicated and people don't have a lot of trust, the United States Census is on track right now to undercount the Black or African American community in the United States right now by about 15%. Jesus. Uh, $1.5 trillion in federal budget dollars that get distributed around the country is at stake. Uh, it's not like it's not going to get spent. It just won't get spent in African, largely African American communities if they don't get counted. Um, it also has a profound impact on how we apportion political power, right? Oh, yeah. Who gets the vote? How we gerrymander, how we set up congressional districts. Um, I can say this to y'all. I think it's being recorded. So uh, can I jump in here? Yeah. Yeah, Kara. Sorry, I really appreciate you um, sharing these questions in the information. We advertise this as a twelve or eleven to twelve minutes. Yeah, we've gone over. So we're going a little bit over, and I'm just sensitive of people's other time that we're starting to lose folks. Yeah, if anybody needs to jump, do. Okay. Yes. Would love to give um, Dr. Jones an opportunity to say some closing words. Um, and then maybe if folks want to, with the fair count, is that going to be on the website? That people I think we just posted it. Kareem, is that right? Uh, yes, yes, the video is available. Great. And notes, if you and want to. Notes. Great. And this video will be available too. We'll post it on the website. And folks well, can... uh, my, my words are very simple. If not now, when? And if not us, who? If not now, when? And if not us, who's going to do it? And I simply spoke to you earlier, which I tried to indicate that there were, there's an external um, objective uh, environment out there that uh, my experience, my, 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 my perception based on my experience tells me that this is one of the greatest opportunities that has occurred in our country in the past 60, 70 years. And it's, it's yours for the, it's, it's great. You're never going to find, well, it certainly won't be in my lifetime. It's something I, it's unprecedented, the opportunity you have now. Unprecedented. Well, we're so grateful for you um, taking the time, making the time to share your experiences and your thinking with us, Dr. Jones. I know that um, you've inspired me and you've also challenged me and given me a lot to think about. Um, so I, I take that to heart and I imagine that many others are, are doing the same. Thank I'm you. also grateful for my colleague Alexander for facilitating the conversation with you and sharing his um, experiences and insights and challenges as a black man and talking about the Black Lives Matter movement that he's been involved, very involved with. And then thank you, Sean, for jumping in and the other folks at the Communications Network for making this happen with Kareem and Carrie and everybody else who joined us today, um, really hope that you'll you'll take away what Dr. Jones has shared and um, go forth and do do good work. Okay, thank you very thank much you for having us. Yeah. Good, thank you so much. Be safe and well, everybody. Thank you.